Get us something. I'm going to get the nutty house boy who's trained to come and try to sneak <laughs> up on him. Yeah. Test him. Yeah. With the correct okay. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase tonight, and join me in welcoming Jack Lemon. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you. Thank you, Jim. I first want to congratulate you on another splendid performance. I thought Prisoner of Second Avenue was just marvelous. Oh, good. Thank Are you pleased with it? Yeah, frankly, yes. Uh, um, I'm not talking about myself. No. Because I, I don't know how objective you can be about your own performance, but uh, I do like the picture. Um, I love Neil Simon's writing, always have, and I've been lucky enough to be in a number of of his productions, but uh, the character itself I love, and I love the fact that he was able to talk about a contemporary problem that we're all in, and do it in, com in very often in comedic terms. That's yeah. rare, yeah. because it's hard to do, in the sense that, it, that the apartment is not totally a comedy. It's mm -hmm. a serious story, but there's a great deal of comedy in it, and it's, it's pertinent uh, and empathetic to the problems. Uh, that all of us go through in our society today, and yet it doesn't hit you over the head with a message about it. Mm -hmm. It tells a story that we can relate to and hopefully enjoy very much, and it's funny as hell to boot. Indeed. So, uh, uh, and in that sense, uh, I was very pleased, and as much as anything, with the chance to finally work with Annie Bancroft. Really? She's the best American actress that ever was, in my opinion. That's quite a statement, too. Oh, what an actress, and what a person to work with. Yeah. You know. For those uh, in the audience who may not be aware of what this particular Neil Simon play is about, could you tell us a little about this? Well, it really is uh, uh, the story of a man who uh, is suffering from the pressures that all of us go through, professionally and socially, no matter what our business or what our income bracket, it doesn't matter. Um, in any uh, major city today, not that the problems aren't affecting you if you live in a much smaller town, but Neil Simon usually writes about New York, not because it's about New York, but New York is his milieu and, he, and he's comfortable with it. But it could be anywhere. But especially in major cities with the minor frustrations on top of everything, uh, of too many people in one place and uh, the callousness of some people, all of the, the strikes, the this, the that, all of which he did, you know, in a mild way in an out of towners, but this is a much bigger extension of that, really, in the next logical step, I would say. And a guy, uh, middle-aged, has worked himself up a good job, good income, loses his job, and all of a sudden, how do you get a job? Where do you go? Uh, what, what can you do? Uh, it's not all that easy, just because you are efficient and uh, knowledgeable. And uh, you can be an old man in your 40s, uh, being replaced by much younger men and by machines, uh, plus the uh, overall economic problem. I think at one point in the film, I refer to the fact that, uh, that the unemployment rate is up to six point something percent. Yeah. Oh, of yeah. course, now by now the film's coming <laughs> out. It seems like yesterday that I did it, but it's already 12%. Yeah. And uh, we live in a very hysterical, pressured cooker uh, today, and this guy gets goes through a nervous breakdown. So now that's hardly funny, and uh, that's why I say it isn't just a comedy, yeah. but there is a great deal of comedy in it, treating a problem that uh, we all know about. I think we're all hysterical today. It's just under the surface. Yeah. And uh, Well, the story will be very familiar, and the incidents in the story, to those who live in the city, but what about those who don't live in the city? Do you think it will? Well, yeah, but I think they can relate to it, mm -hmm. because all we have to do is pick up a paper and know it. You know, someone was mentioning the other day, it'll be very interesting if we do, unfortunately, get into a deep depression in this country. It'll be the first one where we've gone through it with television. Mm. And if we have a bread line, unlike what happened in the 30s, we're going to look up each night, if we can pay the two cents of wattage or whatever, and we're going to see the bread line in Boston, in Milwaukee, in uh, Kansas, and wherever, in Los Angeles wherever it may be. We are all going to be united more than ever before in the same problem. Well, yeah. in that sense, I think that whether you live on a farm or whether you go through Mel Edison, my character, uh, and his wife's problems of living uh, uh, in a pressure cooker in New York City, you are going to relate to it. Yeah. You know, and the overall economic problems are the same for all of us. Yeah. Well, Mel is really the personification of Mr. Every, every mm -hmm. man, really. Yeah. Really. Yes. And, um, Extremely contemporary, you're yeah. right. Neil Simon has been one of the most successful playwrights to come along in a long time. You evidently have a great regard for him. Yes. Why do you think he has been so successful? Well, I, uh, it's difficult to answer. He, he is a man who is very sensitive and very aware of... Uh, uh, he's a very contemporary writer. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, at all times. In other words, he, he's got antenna out, and he's the kind of guy uh, walking down the street that sees something more than the average person sees in the behavior or a little thing that happens at a newsstand or whatever. And he'll file it because he thinks funny, mm -hmm. and he cannot help but think funny. And I think it's quite wonderful when people like Twain or whoever it might be Mm -hmm. uh, you know, can see humor, but see accurately the problems around us. In other words, uh, uh, he's a highly intelligent man with great talent and a great sense of humor. So he is able to discuss problems we all relate to. Half of his success is because we say, oh, yeah, my God, that happened to me, yeah. or else almost, or I know it happened to Aunt Harriet last week, would you believe it? Or it happened to me, but I didn't think it was funny then, but now I look and it's happening to somebody else and it's hilarious, like slipping on the banana yeah. peel. It's always funny, but not when you take the fall. Right. It's when somebody else sits there, but for the grace of God, you know, go I. Uh, and I think that Neil thinks funny and sees humor, but does talk about absolutely honest, legitimate, pertinent problems that we all go through every day. Yeah. But the key, of course, is never losing sight of entertainment. Right. So, no. As I say, he just plain is funny. Yeah. That's all he is. He's a talented writer. We have several scenes from Prisoner of Second Avenue, and this first one is, a, as is all of the film, very funny. And this involves the robbery sequence. Oh, yeah. Does this... it need any setting up? Well, it, it purely and simply, it's, you know, it never rains, but it pours so often that sometimes in our lives, not only is Mel, after 20 years of successful... Uh, rise in the business, lost his job, uh, but he's just gone out to commiserate and have a drink uh, or whatever and look for another job, and he comes back to the apartment. His wife has preceded him by 10 minutes, and the apartment is an absolute mess. On top of everything else, they've just been robbed while they were out. His wife has just come home ahead of him, and I think that's all that needs to be said. In he comes. All right. Here's a scene right now from Jack Lemmon's new film, Prisoner of Second Avenue. A scene from Prisoner of Second Avenue starring Jack Lemmon, a film directed by Mel Frank, who I must say is a tremendously gifted director and you've worked with some of the best. How did you like working with Mel Frank? Mel is uh, a pussycat. <laughs> he really is, and I mean that to say he's not only obviously very talented, yeah. I think his, his last film was A Touch of Class. And he was, in, the, in, in an immensely successful film. Uh, he is one of the nicest men, personally and professionally, that I have ever met. And uh, certainly one of the finest, uh, you know, in a sense, as young as he feels and thinks, mm -hmm. we could call him an old-timer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he's been through the mill and done some of the best, as a writer and director, some of the best films, uh, uh, you know, that Hollywood's ever come out with in comedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed it immensely because I knew I trusted him. I knew I was working with a real pro and, as I say, personally, a mile. You, know, you made quite a statement about Anne Bancroft being yeah. your, the best actress, really, yeah. that you've worked with. Many people, I don't think, realize that she is so tremendously gifted at comedy, having only seen her in things like The Miracle Worker yeah. and so forth. Um, yet she's a fantastically gifted comedian. Yes, she is. Well, see, she knows better than to try to be funny. That's mm -hmm. the trap that an awful lot of people who haven't done much comedy fall into. They can't lose the fact that it's supposed to be funny, and they unconsciously are kind of winking to the audience, saying, this is funny, folks, and that's disaster. Uh, and we all, through rehearsals, uh, all of us took the same bent on this material, Mel and Ann and I, that there's nothing funny about it. Mm -hmm. And if we proceed on that premise, because how funny can it be? A man loses his job, and can't get another job, and is going through a nervous breakdown. Well, that's hardly the platform for, for comedy. And yet, uh, a man like Simon can still throw a million laughs into a serious problem. The only thing is, you must not play it as comedy. They'll no. laugh, and it is funny, and we know already from the reactions of people, they scream, but at the same time, they are with the, uh, uh, the dramatic elements of the story. You just play it honestly. And that's all Annie does. You just play it as honestly as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the laughs come, they come. But we never played for a laugh. If anything, we shied away from it, mm. rather than try to belt a, a laugh out. Uh, it's just that very funny things happen in extremely dramatic moments. And if I... Can I take another second yeah. while we're on this point? I could really... If I would just shut my mouth now and then and just give an example, instead of having diarrhea of the mouth, I can never stop. 
Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, no, when we were in rehearsals, and as a matter of fact, in a major magazine a few weeks ago, uh, uh, in a cover story about her husband, Mel Brooks, who's one of the funniest men on earth, he told a story that she told me months ago when we were in rehearsal to, to point out what I am saying about how funny things can be when you don't, if you don't try to be funny. He, uh, Mel and Annie, personally, were having a big row over something or other. And as can happen, it really got into the, the hollering back and forth at each other thing. And Mel, at one point, grabbed her by both arms, trying to say, well, you be quiet and listen with this and that. And she suddenly said, don't touch my body. It's my instrument. <laughs> you see? Now, without a beat, Mel then says, oh, really? It's your it's Then play begin to begin. <laughs> well, then they both howled. But neither one of them said those lines and thought they were funny. They were dead serious. Now, that's my point. Prisoner gets that kind of thing, but they are hardly being funny when they say them. Yeah. They're being dead serious. The best and most effective comedy, I think, always comes when the characters are their most serious. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments that we really remember. And at any point can be made more effectively, I think, with comedy within a dramatic framework than by straight drama. They're the hooks. Those are the things that people will remember even more. Mm -hmm. uh, comedy with a point of view, in other words, where the author has a point of view, uh, when it is successful, is more successful than a straight drama. In mm -hmm. other words, I, I think that A Prisoner of Second Avenue was done just purely as a straight drama. God knows it's there. The problem is there. But I don't think it would be anywhere near as effective no. as it will because there is so much comedy in it. Yeah. You know, and it never hits you over the head with it. There is always, it's lightened. Yeah. You know, with comedy. Few actors have been as successful, really, playing both drama and comedy as you have. In fact, you've won an Oscar for doing both, in fact. Do you, do you find comedy more difficult? Yes. In general. Mm -hmm. uh, strangely enough, the two uh, dramas that I am best remember, remembered for, as straight dramas, are uh, Save the Tiger and Days of Wine and Roses. Now, those two specific parts I found personally very, very difficult, mm -hmm. as difficult if not more difficult than anything I've done. But, excluding that, in general, I think that comedy is more difficult yeah. to write, to direct, and to act successfully. Because there's some onus that's put on comedy. It, it doesn't have an in-between kind of, that's not bad. If you're intended to laugh and it isn't funny, then it goes from a failure, uh, from a success to a failure. That, that middle ground is yeah. sort of out. If they don't laugh, <laughs> boom, forget it. It just leaves an omelet lying. Yeah. Let me ask you about some of your films with one of my favorite directors who just happens to be one of the best filmmakers in the world, and that's Billy Wilder. Yeah. Uh, front page is your sixth film with him, I believe. Right. How did your association with him come about? Well, I did years ago um, a very tiny little comedy called Operation Madball mm -hmm. with Ernie Kovacs yeah. and Mickey Rooney and another assorted bunch of nuts. And it was a ball. We had great fun and uh, with another then young director named Richard Quine at Columbia, who was one of my oldest and dearest friends. And then we were just a bunch of young guys making films mm -hmm. when they'd give us 10 cents. Billy saw Operation Madball, and he loved it. And uh, he had seen Roberts, uh, which I had done, and uh, a few, I think it was about my eighth film. But this one really got to him, and he liked it. So when Some Like It Hot popped into his mind, he thought of me, and uh, I didn't know that. And I was having dinner at a little restaurant and uh, uh, with my future wife, Alicia, and uh, I had met Billy, only, hello, how are you? Yeah. He happened to be there, and he popped over to the table and said, excuse me, may I sit for a second? And I said, certainly. Introduced him to Felicia, and he says, I'll be direct and right to the point. He says, I got a story here, St. Valentine's Day Massacre, with you <laughs> and some other guy, and you witnessed the massacre, and they see that you witnessed it, and now you are on what we call in the trade, the lab. Now, while you're on the land, the only thing you can do is dress up like broads and join an all-girl orchestra because you're a musician, you're toot, 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 toot. <laughs> and, uh, well, let's put it this way. For 85% of the picture, you're in drag. Do you want to do it? And I said, sure. <laughs> like a ding-dong. I didn't know any better. But it was Billy. And somehow the bulb went off, you know. Uh, so it turned out to be something like it yeah. not. And uh, that started the relationship. And uh, it's just... You know, within a week into it, I was within, in, in heaven because he is one of the most stimulating people that I've ever known in my life. And we're very close in every minute. Why? What does he and do? That is there's just something about this guy. The best way I can put it is that was 1958. 
So it's like, you know, almost, uh, what, it's more than 25 years. What is it, 58, 68? Yeah, no, it's, about, more, yeah. it's about 17 years, yeah. whatever it is. I can't add. I think that's where I became an actor. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I also can't play golf. You want to talk? About, well, never mind. <laughs> uh, I cannot remember 30 yeah. seconds in all of these years, and we've been very close, of being with Billy Wilder that were dull. It's mm. an impossibility. He has antenna out. He's like Jimmy Cagney in that sense. Extremely bright, far beyond the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at him and that mind and how fast it goes and how full it is of knowledge in yeah. all areas, not just our work. We, we don't talk about film that much, really. To be with him is to be with a man who can discuss anything. And he's got these antenna out about everything. He's an expert on anything. Mm -hmm. And he's also, he even slides over the borderline of opinion into being opinionated. But whatever it is, it is strong. Yeah. and definite, and he, he he's provocative and uh, uh, terribly, terribly funny. But it's astounding how a man... Very who, funny man. How a man who directed some of the greatest dramas of all time, mm -hmm. like Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard, could also direct some of the best comedies. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah. You have often worked with uh, the same directors, six times for Billy Wilder, a number of times for Richard Quine and Blake Edwards. Is this coincidental? No. Uh, I think that what happens is that... Uh, uh, there are times when it's almost like an inevitability of uh, people happen to meet and it becomes almost a collaboration because it works. Yeah. Like uh, uh, Billy has, in all of these years, and he started out writing Ninochka for Garbo, going way back. Um, in the 30 years or more that Billy has been making films here, he has only had two collaborators because they worked. And you don't tip over the apple cart, in yeah. other words. Yeah. So you look for people uh, that you know you work successfully with. You may do a failure next time, but that but it's not always going to be that way. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did five more pictures with Billy, um, and they were all failures, I would still be anxiously awaiting the sixth, because it won't always be. And yeah. when you work with this man, it is unique. And when they are not failures and they are successes, they are the rare ones that are gems very yeah. often. It'll be a long time before anybody writes and directs a farce on the level of Some Like It Hard. It's That's classic right. to have had that experience, or the apartment, the Irma, whatever it may be. They are extraordinary experiences, and it's worth it yeah. for the hits and the misses to work with a guy like that, yeah. and to love and have the joy of working with an astounding man like that, and to respect him on a, a unique level you know, that's different. I mean, there's an awful lot of people that I love working with and that I respect, and then again, there is Wilder. All right. All you know. Right. Um, so it's more by design, really. And, yeah. and there also is a kind of uh, a charisma that happens, uh, a, a, a chemistry with some people, mm -hmm. uh, actors and directors and actors and actors. Uh, working with Walter, working with Annie Bancroft, there's something that happens where you're in the scenes and you're not thinking of lines, cues, or anything else. It just happens. You act with instead of acting at, which is what happens most of the time. Um, and that's rare. Yeah. Uh, these things uh, are not common, and when they do happen, then you search to find things together. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Let me ask you something about the great race. This is a picture I enjoy every time I see it. It's In fun. it, you played Professor Fate, right. and you got to do something you don't usually get to do, and that is play a, a really distinct kind of... Yeah. Way out character. Was this... Yeah, somebody really removed from yeah. me. Was this yeah. particularly fun? Yes, it was. Uh, and not only because of Blake Edwards, who co-wrote and directed it, um, but also because it was zany and far out. And there is a great attraction to actors, very often, I think, to play characters unlike Mel Edison mm -hmm. in Prisoner, uh, but like uh, the character in Some Like It Hot, that are absolutely removed from you. Okay? They're from the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you really feel a kind of freedom and an abandonment. And it's great fun to play somebody and become somebody else that has nothing to do with you yeah. whatsoever. Not a contemporary character that's identifiable. I don't know why. I guess psychologically th there's a need to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. Forget your own problems yeah. and guilts and neuroses or whatever. Because you come to life as some somebody that you never dreamed of or knew. And it's great fun to investigate and find and build this character you know, yeah. all of your own, and, and, uh, and, and play it. And you do it with a kind of enjoyment and abandon that you might not be able to do with someone who is more contemporary and like you. Yeah. Getting back to Prisoner of Second Avenue, we have another scene. This features Gene Sachs, 
Uh, he is attempting to give you the twenty-five thousand yeah. dollar check. What do you? Well, let me let me just preface it uh, very briefly so it'll make sense uh, uh, when you see it. It's always difficult, as yeah. you know, taking the scene out of context um, and and then showing it out of the framework where it's that is intended to be. But having gone, lost my job, eventually having had a nervous breakdown. Uh, during that, my brother, played by Gene Sachs, has attempted, with the help of my two sisters also, to put me back on my feet, not only emotionally, but mainly economically, by offering to loan us money. And then there was a big hassle about uh, uh, $25,000 for a summer camp. My wife, played by Annie, wanted me to uh, get away from the rat race and try to uh, run a summer camp for kids. Well, it came to naught eventually. Uh, until I came out of the breakdown. Now, finally, my brother has reached uh, the point where he's in a position to offer me money to help me. In other words, I'm through the, the mental breakdown, but I still have not gotten a job. I think that's that the point. All right. Here's another scene from Prisoner of Second Avenue. A scene from Prisoner of Second Avenue, and our time is up. Jack Lemon, it has been a great pleasure. Jim, I've enjoyed it. Come to Atlanta and see us. I would love it. Thank you. My thanks to all of you. Good night. Hello, I'm Jim Whaley. This week on Cinema Showcase, my guest is one of the world's fine actors, Mr. Jack Lemon. His new film is Mel Frank's The Prisoner of Second Avenue. So join me this week as I talk with Jack Lemon. That was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'll say 80, mm, about 16, right, John? Yeah. Okay, Karen, I'm going to have you doing this. I'll try to make sure that. Oh.